to Love the Truth Media, a teaching ministry of Pastor Steve Wiseman of Peewee Valley Baptist Church in Peewee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at lovethetruthmedia.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve to continue our verse-by-verse study in the book of Philippians. We're in the first chapter of Philippians, continuing our study verse-by-verse through this book. Philippians chapter 1, today we will turn our attention beginning at verse 12 and continuing to verse 18. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. And if you're able, stand with me at the reading of God's Word, beginning at verse 12 in this first chapter of Philippians. The Scripture says here, "...but I would you should understand, brethren..." that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in that I do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we can read it, that we can study it and that we can talk about it today. Father, um, we ask that the message that we, that we hear today would be your message, uh, that man would not interfere with the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit that will operate within us to give us the understanding of your message. And so, Father, teach us today and guide us through your word. Change us so that we'll be molded and to be more like you. And we'll give you praise and thanks for the work that you'll do in our midst here today. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This passage of Scripture I've titled, The Truth Cannot Be Harnessed. The Truth Cannot Be Harnessed. We're right on the, the verge of the Kentucky Derby here, an event that as soon as the Derby's over, they start the clock. 364 days to the Derby. <laughs> I don't know of many other events that's looked forward to with such great anticipation as the Kentucky Derby. Even before I got here, it was such a, a monumental event, be living out in Virginia. Um, and we always jumped in front of the television when the Kentucky Derby came on. We didn't ever do that so much for the, the Preakness and the Belmont, but we always made sure we watched that. So when I got my first opportunity to go to the Derby, we jumped on the opportunity years ago. What we found out, it's not so much a horse race as it is a fashion event. But <laughs> you gotta, you gotta, it's all about the hat. It's all about the hat. So instead of the horse. But the horses are important, of course. And uh, there's lots of things regarding that. But I don't want to get into that. But the, the truth is, the horse can be harnessed. Uh, and that's how they're able to race those horses and accomplish what they do. Uh, but the truth of God, you can't harness it. You can't harness it. And Paul is a living example of that. And not only Paul, but others, as we see in this particular passage of Scripture. The truth cannot be harnessed. Uh, the truth, of course, is the good news. It's the gospel. It's the scriptures. It's the word of God. And to harness just means to restrain or to guide or to somehow control or limit in a way. So in verses 12 and 13, we'll look at our first point regarding the um, inability to harness the truth. And that is that preventive measures promote the gospel. Preventive measures promote the gospel. And I say preventive measures, it's those things that people do in order to prevent people from promoting the gospel. But actually, it has the opposite effect. Case in point is one we're all familiar with, and that is when they took prayer out of the schools. They took the prayer out of the school. So no longer, well, thank the Lord, um, Trace is in a Christian school, 
and they still say prayer. And not only do they still pray prayer before classes, every teacher prays in every class for every student. The administrators are praying for the teachers and for the students. And it's just a circle of prayer that goes on. And it's orchestrated by the school. But outside of the Christian school environment, you're not permitted to pray in most circumstances. At least they think, right? They say they took prayer out of the schools. I've said for a long time, they haven't taken prayer out of the schools. The the actual effect of what they've done should be that they've actually strengthened prayer in the schools. The opposite effect has taken place. Because the real Christian that goes to the classroom on any given school morning knows and that knows Christ as a personal Savior is still going to pray and they're cognizant of the fact that the school has restricted them from doing that public prayer called the Lord's Prayer. And now their prayer is a personal prayer. It's meaningful. It's not just a recitation of something. And in fact, what they've done for the Christian who loves the Lord, they've strengthened your prayer life. Amen? It has the opposite effect. We want to talk about that in this passage. So the things that people do to prevent the spreading of the gospel actually promotes the gospel. And we have uh, an example here in the life of Paul. It says here in verse 12, But I would, as Paul writes to the church at Philippi, But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. So Paul writes and says, Philippians, you need to understand one basic truth here. And that is the things that I have experienced. And of course, Paul's talking about not only the difficulty of being in prison, not for anything having having been done wrong, but also the journey to Rome, to that Roman prison, shipwreck and everything else. And discouragement from from others who said, oh, you shouldn't be going there. They're going to kill you there. Paul uh, had many obstacles in his journey to get to Rome. And it seems like when you imprison somebody who's such a, a strong advocate for the word that you have somehow prevented them from preaching the word. The opposite, in fact, is true. For the one who loves the Lord and will be obedient to God and not to men. It says, Philippians, you need to understand this. And that is that all of these things that have happened unto me, including the journey and the jailing in Rome, they have fallen out rather. The word rather here really gives us this indication that the thing that we would logically or presumably expect to happen because of the difficulty he had getting there and because of him being in prison would actually harness the preaching of the word and limit it or restrict it in some way. But he says, it has actually fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel. Now this word furtherance comes from the pioneer days, even in the the time it was written, where they would take uh, scythes or or, or blades and they would cut their way through a forest and they'd find their, uh, cut their path as they went forward, making progress and advancing to their goal. And that's what the word means, this furtherance. Uh, It was a military term that was used in order to accomplish successive battle, victories in battle, as you move from one place to another to accomplish your overall objective. And so Paul's objective was to spread the word of God. And what Paul's saying to the Corinthians, I mean to the Philippians here, is that what's happened to me hasn't been the expected outcome that it would diminish the, the impact upon others, but that God would actually use me in a different way than what we would expect for the progress and advancement of the word of God. Literally, the furtherance of the gospel. He said, so in verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ, my imprisonment, it says my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. Everybody here knows that I'm in prison. But the good news is that as Paul had occasion to live his life, his Christian life in prison, demonstrating the principles and declaring the truths of God's word, that they began, began to understand that Paul wasn't a criminal, but Paul was a preacher who preached the truth. 
So the imprisonment of Paul actually worked to strengthen his message. Not only did all of those responsible in the palace guard for the guarding of his of his security get to know the gospel, but it says all others. It says it's manifest in all the palace and in all other places. So that which was known by the palace guards began to be spread among their friends, their associates, their colleagues, through the neighborhoods and through the city. And the word began to be advanced outside of the prison. Of course, them having imprisoned him for having spoken the truth. What they've actually done in trying to limit it or harness it was to release it. In our daily lives... There are things that happen where we think we don't have liberty to be bold or courageous concerning the word of God. Look at verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, these are the brothers and sisters, believers, they're Christians, and they were waxing or becoming confident. The word means bold. They were becoming bold, and the word many means most of them. The ones even that were reluctant to declare the good news of the gospel began to receive boldness and exercise that boldness wherever they went. And it says they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Much like Peter and John, when they were threatened not to ever speak in the name of Jesus again or to mention his name, they went back to the camp and prayed. The ground shook. The people became more bold to speak candidly and clearly the word of God. And the word of God resounded from there. That's what was happening in Rome because they got Paul in a prison there in Rome. Isn't it amazing that you can't harness God's power. You can try to restrict it. You can try to pigeonhole it. You can try to shut it down. You can try to cut it off. And you can try everything else. But God's Word will accomplish what He wants. And it will go wherever He wants. And people aren't going to be able to stop it. So don't ever think that the situation you're in, and I'll give you a good example. Uh, maybe Maybe you work for a living. And if you work for a living, then in your place of employment, you might think that there's no opportunity to share the gospel because they don't want you reading a Bible. People have actually been fired for having a Bible uh, in their possession in a workplace environment after having been told not to have one there. We understand that. What's happened when... But see, we get all uptight about our own personal circumstance and think, well, you know, I I can't lose my job. What's more important, the Word of God or our job? Some people make bad decisions. Some people make good decisions. But one thing we need to understand, and that is the Word of God is the most important thing that we have in our possession as Christians. It's the most important thing. Having been saved by the grace of God, we must be the light. We must be the light that spreads the good news to other people so that the light reveals the darkness or the sin in their lives so that they too will come in contact with the message of salvation and hopefully receive by faith God's offer of salvation so freely. But if we're not willing to do that, so in a workplace... There are people that have been fired for doing that. Guess what happens? They put it on the news and everybody in the world knows this person got fired. The word spreads like a wildfire. And okay, you say, well, that person lost their job. What a sacrifice. And in some cases, that's it. Some people just want to do it in spite. That's a bad decision. You don't do something just in spite. But just because you can't recite a prayer openly... God says when you pray in Matthew's uh, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, God says when you pray, enter into your prayer closet and pray. So your prayer closet can be wherever you are. It doesn't have to be a designated space in your house where there's no light. Wherever you are is your prayer closet. The, the idea behind that That principle is that we're not out there trying to be like the Pharisees who are beating on their chest talking about how good they were. But their prayers are not meant 
to entice or to somehow persuade other people or to make them think that we're better than we are if they're not even intended that other people would necessarily hear them, our prayers are to the Lord. And if other people hear that, that's okay. But the intent of our prayers is communication with God. So we pray openly in the church. That prayer should be one that's directed to God for His purpose in adoration and praise and worship of Him, making supplication and request. It's not that other people would hear a good oration in prayer. That's not what it's all about. So people aren't going to be able to shut us down where we are. We can still operate on the grace of God and the power of God to accomplish His purposes wherever we are. In fact, when people try to restrict us, what they're going to find is that it's going to spread more. That's why they get mad. That's why they get mad. And they get mad. Because they get mad, that's why Paul was in prison. Because they got mad. Sometimes I think we're not willing to be persecuted for Christ's sake. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why? Because we can't put a lampshade on. We can't clam it up. We need to speak it out. We need to speak it out. Amen, brother. So the, the news here is that all of these things they did to try to prevent Paul from spreading the word had the opposite effect, rather, to the furtherance of the gospel. And in verse 14... He says, even these other folks, many or most of the believers there were becoming confident or bold because of his imprisonment and his witness from prison. And they became bold. It sort of runs like a contagion. Do You have contagious witnessing in your life. Let's hope so. The second point here is uh, found in verses 14 to 17. Not only do these preventive measures promote the gospel, but pretentious efforts propagate the gospel. Pretentious efforts. Now, Paul had some opposition. The good news about this opposition is they were actually preaching the gospel. In verse um, 14, it says, And many of the brethren of the Lord, becoming confident by bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife. Now the word envy there is jealousy. No doubt they were jealous of Paul's uh, position as an apostle. They were jealous of his success in spreading the word of God. No doubt jealous because of the following that accompanied that preaching of the truth. They were jealous for many different reasons. And some were indeed um, contentious. This word strife means that they were contentious. Uh, they, they had a rivalry against Paul. And as they rivaled against him or contended with him, they did it selfishly to try to promote their own interests and advance their own uh, magnification. So we see here in verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. Even though there was jealousy and contention among these opposers of Paul, they were still preaching the gospel. <laughs> Get that? There were people that were pretending to be something better than what they were. They had self-ambition. They had objectives to promote themselves. But even those things, we look and say, you know what? That's just rotten and it's no good. Paul said, even these people, even these people, contentious and with rivalry and jealous with envy, were still preaching the gospel. So guess what? The gospel was still spreading, even though there was opposition to him in that area. So... Those things that were pretentious by nature. And where do I get that word from? If you look in verse 18, it says, Every way, whether in pretense or in truth. So there were, there were people that were pretending to be something that they weren't. 
And they had false pretenses for their preaching. Their false pretense was they weren't trying necessarily to glorify the Lord, although they were in their preaching because they were preaching a good gospel, according to what Paul said. But one of their primary interests was to advance themselves in addition to preaching the gospel. So yes, they were, they were elevating and magnifying and testifying and witnessing and teaching about Christ, but they also had another motive going on alternatively, and that was to promote themselves to be the one to follow instead of Paul, to be a step ahead or a step above Paul. So this word uh, that we find there in verse 15, this strife has that sense of rivalry. They took it upon themselves to establish this contentious rivalry with Paul that in their self-ambition, they would raise themselves to a higher level. They didn't abandon the truth in doing so. Just because somebody's preaching of envy and strife doesn't mean that they're not preaching the gospel. Not everybody that preaches the gossip has all their motives lined up to be true and accurate. But Paul said, these folks are preaching the truth, but they've got some other things going on. But even that is working to propagate the gospel because they're still preaching the gospel. They did it with the intention, with another motive, but they were still preaching the gospel. So what? People are still hearing. People are still getting saved. Amen? Now, so these pretentious efforts only work, if you will, to breed or to cause to continue. We'll call it um, cause to spread the gospel. It affected a greater number of people. And it says in verse 16, the one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely. And it says, um, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So they're trying to sort of hammer down on Paul. Paul's in prison. These folks are free. Oh, they, so what they're doing is saying, yeah, Paul's over here. And, and even though they may not be personally be naming him to drag him down, the efforts of what they're doing were putting Paul in a position to appear to be less fruitful and less, less beneficial for the work of the Lord. Now, if you're in Paul's shoes, you might take offense at that. You know what I mean? Might take offense at that. Because I'm the target of some negative activity. But that's not what Paul did. Paul said, these people are preaching the gospel. People are still getting saved. People are still being instructed in the ways of righteousness. So I'm going to be glad for that. I'm going to be glad for that. Because Paul wasn't interested in elevating himself. He was truly the servant of God that we find in Philippians chapter 2 in verse 7, Christ who set the primary example but made himself of no reputation. So Paul was willing not to have a good reputation. He's over there in jail. The connotation of being in prison in and of itself has negative connotation, um, negative uh, impact. So when you add the impact of these preachers who were going around hammering on Paul to some extent in order to elevate themselves, you would think Paul might be upset. He's glad that they're preaching the gospel. Now, if there were false teachers, it'd be a different story. But he was glad. And we'll see that joy in a minute. But it says in verse 17, but the other of love, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. The word set means appointed. I am appointed to be a preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles which was his calling from the Lord when he got knocked down on, off his uh, animal and got saved by the grace of God. He was to go and preach the word to the Gentiles, and he's even doing that from prison. And the impact that Paul was able to have by the power of God working through him in his total submission to God went far beyond the walls of the prison. And the impact we can have on other people's lives can also go way beyond the walls of this church or our individual residences. If we will be, if we will be like Paul and not get upset with every little innuendo that goes on. Every little thing that might offend somebody and people will get too picky and they get too sensitive and say, well, they offended me. Paul was saying, Offended me is okay as long as they're teaching and preaching the gospel and witnessing the truth. Let them go on. 
We get too uptight about self. We need to abandon our reputation and put our salvation out there on the line. We can't lose it, but we need to put it out there for people to see it. And not worry about what somebody else is doing, whether it's better or greater, or whether it's contentious or rivalrous. Uh, it involves rivalry against us. It doesn't matter. So these pretentious efforts... Uh, We're actually propagating the gospel as we see there. And then in verse 18, um, kind of some big words here, but I put preclusive restrictions proliferate the word. Now this word, why do I use preclusive? This word uh, to preclude, the people try to preclude, uh, that is make it it difficult or impossible to, to speak the word or to pray or to exercise our Christian liberty. They try to preclude that. The workplace does it, the government does it, the public does it. When we want to go out and and talk about the Lord, people do what? They shut us down, they ostracize us, they change the subject, and all these other things. They want to work to preclude us, to stop us, to make it more difficult for us to advance the Word of God. And their preclusive restrictions on our freedom to be, be bold and candid and courageous around the Word... They will, in the life of the Christian who wants to be obedient to the Lord, they will actually work for the increase or the proliferation of the gospel. Verse 18 says, what then? So what can we say about all of this? Now remember back in verse 11 in our last study, Paul Paul talked about the Philippians and his desire for them to be full of the fruits of righteousness. The fruits of righteousness involve your testimony and your witness and the things that you don't say because they speak even louder than the things that you do many times. But it says in verse 18, so what then? Understanding that all of these things are happening around us, what can we conclude? Verse 18, notwithstanding, every way. What is that? Every way. Don't pass over Those two words without contemplating on them and pondering them a little bit. Because there are some ways in our life that we consider to be too difficult, that we consider to be untenable, that we consider to be uh, restricting us in some way or limiting us or stopping us or somehow pressing us down. But in every way, Paul says, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. Christ is preached. And so he says, and in that, I do rejoice and will rejoice. Amen. I do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. Our joy is irrespective of circumstances in the life of the true believer who's obedient to God. It doesn't matter what's happening around us in order to harness our opportunity to spread the word. If we would understand this, as Paul got their attention in verse 12, I want you to understand, brethren, and that is we need to understand that every attempt to restrict our opportunity actually becomes an opportunity in and of itself. Because who can separate us from the love of God? Nobody. Who can stop us? Who can stop us? From loving the Lord and sharing the Lord with other people. Nobody can stop us. They can put you in a prison. They can put shackles on you and put you in a place where it's not very pleasant. They still can't stop you. What did Paul do? Even at Philippi when he was jailed. He he praised the Lord in song and the doors of the jail were broken free. And not only were were him and Silas freed, but all the rest of them were freed. The impact it has on other people is phenomenal. Actually, it's spiritual. Because what happens is, God, if we're obedient to God, everything that looks like a restriction on our opportunity actually becomes an opportunity to overcome the restriction. Because we are more, more than victorious through Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors. Through Christ. If we're trying to accomplish God's will, if we're trying to save our reputation or establish our own footing somewhere, that's not going to work. 
But if our will is to please God and to do His desire, it'll work every time. If it's an obedient step in a, in a, in a, in a right direction of righteousness... Everything, whatever's happened, he says, the things which have happened unto me in verse 12, all those things that have happened have worked for the advancement of the gospel. For the child of God that's obedient to the Lord, your spreading of the word cannot be harnessed. You know what happens to us? We harness ourselves. So what's stopping us? What's stopping you? What's stopping me from spreading the gospel? What is it in our life that we have sensed as a restriction of some sort and it's caused us to diminish our impact on the people around us? What is it? What is it? Is it, is it in the family kind of taboo in certain settings not to talk about the Lord? That's a restriction that's put on our life. We ought to use it as an opportunity And the scripture says, he that winneth souls is wise. We need to exercise the wisdom of God. And every situation we get ourselves into, God becomes not only our ability, but God gives us the knowledge to move forward and to do the thing that is right and that is righteous in his sight. So um, we, we need to be speaking up for Christ in whatever we're doing and stop looking at situations as harnessing the power of God because you can't do that. God God will even speak through an animal. We've seen that in the Scriptures. To somebody who's stubborn and doesn't want to do His will. That's what God will do. And God will move and stir in our midst and all we have to do is be obedient and watch the Lord work. And instead of it being a hindrance, it's actually an opportunity. Turn your hindrances into opportunities. Let's stand together. Father, we thank You for Your Word, how precious it is. We know that it is entirely accurate and truthful in every respect. What's given to us in the pages of our Bible is that which was inspired by You to human authors as You guided their hand and directed their very words. So, Father, we accept that which you've given to us. We put our faith in that which you've given to us. And we trust it with every fiber of our being. Father, we need to understand, like the Philippians needed to understand, that the fruits of righteousness should be working in us. That the power of God that's residing in us uh, should should not be held back. But we need to release, release the power of God in us. Not that we have any power but that we're inhibiting, we're inhibiting the advancement of the gospel by not being courageous, by not praying, by not speaking out, by not giving a witness, not giving a testimony, by not pointing to Christ in all that we do. We know, Lord, You've told us that in whatsoever things we do, whether in word or deed, to do all for Your glory and for Your honor. We're not our own, but we've been bought with a price. So may we abandon literally our reputation as Paul did and seek simply to please You, not other people. Give us the presence of mind through the Holy Spirit. Give us the heart through the power of the Lord that lives within us. Father, to be the servants that You want us to be in every place that we go. And we'll give You praise and thanks for the work that You'll do in us. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.